Last week on my podcast, The Atomic Hobo, we talked about Threads, the nuclear war film, and why milk features so often in the film. Now, I had thought that's because milk represents comforting British domesticity, and it represents health and wholesomeness. It represents domestic routines, picking up the milk bottles from the doorstep and taking them inside to lay the kitchen table and make a cup of tea. All of that, all of that reassuring routine, all of that health and wholesomeness is all about to be smashed, of course, by nuclear war. But one of my Facebook followers had the idea that perhaps milk appears so often because milk is the product which is susceptible to nuclear war, nuclear disaster, nuclear fallout. Because if you look at Chernobyl, Fukushima, wind scale, for example, after those disasters, it is always milk which has to be gathered and tested, often found to be contaminated, and which has to be thrown away by the gallon. So in this episode, we're going to look at the wind scale nuclear fire and what it did to all the local milk supplies. First, why milk? After a nuclear disaster, if there is fallout, drifting and descending, it's going to descend on everything, doesn't it? It's not going to zoom in on cows and their milk churns. It's going to fall on a potato crop or a carrot patch just as much as it will fall on some cows. So why is it always milk which seems to get the the brunt of a nuclear disaster? Well, there are several reasons why it's always milk which is so horribly contaminated and deemed often dangerous for human consumption. The first reason is speed. Yes, potatoes will be contaminated by nuclear fallout, but it takes them a long time to grow. It takes them a long time to be pulled from the ground, and by the time they've reached your dinner plate, the radioactive baddies on them will probably have had time to decay. Not so with milk, which is turned around very, very fast. Of course, milk goes sour, and cows are milked every day, I think. I don't know much about farms. But uh, milk is the product which is turned around and delivered and consumed much quicker than anything else on the farm. And so with milk, there isn't enough time for the radiation to decay. So cows eat the contaminated grass. They are then milked. The milk is speedily processed, sent out to the shops, and it's on our table in a very, very quick turnaround. No other product, I suppose, is distributed and consumed so fast leaving little time for the radiation to decay. Also with milk, there's the horrible fact that children tend to drink a lot more of it than adults. And their bodies, of course, are smaller and are still developing, and so they're more vulnerable. Now let's take a quick look at the wind-scale nuclear fire before we go on. Britain's worst nuclear accident. And if you want a brilliant read on the disaster, I recommend the book Fallout by Fred Pierce which covers wind scale and every other nuclear disaster, nuclear accident, nuclear incident, nuclear horror, nuclear odyssey. Uh, If you look back through my videos, I've reviewed the book. I did that a couple of weeks ago. I recommend it completely to you. So what happened at wind scale? Uh, Before we go on, for the avoidance of any confusion, wind scale was, of course, later renamed Sellafield. Now, wind scale was built because the Americans had cut us off. British scientists, of course, had worked with the Americans on the Manhattan Project, building the world's first atomic bomb. But after the war, the Americans decided they wanted to go it alone. They wanted to keep the information and the expertise and the power to themselves. And so they kicked the British scientists out. They told them to go home and forget everything they knew about nuclear bombs. They even forbade them from discussing things with their American colleagues. This was all done under the 1946 McMahon Act, which ended all nuclear collaboration. So much for the special relationship. So Britain decided, well, if we've been cut off, we'll need to build our own bomb. 
and they justified this by telling themselves, and as we kept telling ourselves for quite a while after the war, some people are still telling themselves this now, that we are still a top power, we still merit a seat at the top table, and one of the best ways of demonstrating that power is by having this spectacular new weapon, this atomic bomb. Of course, America had it, and then the Soviet Union had it. Britain wanted to join in. So, Britain had the knowledge, of course. Our scientists had worked on the Manhattan Project. We had the knowledge, we had the needs to build it, or the desire to build it. We were able to throw money behind it. But we didn't have the material to put inside the bomb. We needed plutonium. And so we needed a nuclear reactor to create the stuff. And so we built Windscale. And in 1952, Windscale delivered its first bouncing baby, a big bundle of plutonium. And that was used in Britain's first atomic bomb. But there wasn't really room for a lot of celebration amongst the British scientists because as soon as they had detonated their first atomic bomb, they were told, get back to work, we need a hydrogen bomb. Because of course, by this time, by the 50s, the Americans and the Soviets were running far ahead of us and had left little atomic bombs behind and were now playing with building hydrogen bombs, which as we know, make atomic bombs look like whoopee cushions. So they were sent back to Windscale and told, get back to work, churn out more plutonium, we need to build a hydrogen bomb. But there was a problem. A lot of the work, most of the work on the hydrogen bomb had been done in America after the British had been sent home. So we weren't exactly brimming with the knowledge on how to build one. But that didn't deter the Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, who was desperate to get one of these. He urged the scientists and the workers at Windscale to keep going, keep going, we must have this hydrogen bomb. And there were two reasons for his urgency, according to Fred Pierce's book. One was that he thought a test ban on hydrogen bombs might soon arise, and that would of course stamp out Britain's building and testing of the weapon. But he also, Macmillan, entertained dreams that if we could only get a hydrogen bomb, the Americans would take us seriously once again and invite us back into their nuclear collaboration. So Macmillan and the British government were urging Windscale to work harder, work faster, get us a hydrogen bomb. So there was a huge pressure on Windscale. Politics, which arguably should keep its beak out, was trying to rush science along, perhaps faster than was comfortable. Now, how did Windscale produce its plutonium? The two piles at Windscale, the two gigantic chimneys, each had a huge oven. And into this, you would load cans of uranium and start a nuclear reaction. There was also graphite. The cans were put inside graphite, which acted as a moderator, which would help slow down, if necessary, the nuclear reaction, keeping things in check, I suppose. Now, let me read you an extract from Fred Pierce's book, who explains it all far better than I can about what happened and what went wrong at Windscale. The system was primitive, but it worked. But as demands for more and more plutonium and tritium grew through the summer of 1957, the scientists running the piles were in a quandary. They knew that the intense reactions in the pile caused the graphite that contained the uranium to gradually swell and hold energy, known as Wigner energy, after the Hungarian scientist Eugene Wigner who discovered it. Wigner energy was dangerous. It could cause a reactor fire. So, the scientists periodically reduced the swelling by shutting down the piles and allowing the core to heat up gradually with the cooling fans turned off. This technique for releasing the Wigner energy was potentially dangerous because too much heat 
could itself trigger a pile fire. And the longer the delay before each release, the more dangerous it was. To make matters worse, alterations to the pile to manufacture more tritium had created hot spots that were unknown because thermometers inside were in the wrong place. And the piles had no operating manual. With the wind scale scientists cut off from the expertise of their Hanford cousins, the Americans, everything had to be done by trial and error. As a rule of thumb, they made Wigner energy releases every 20,000 megawatt days, which meant every few months. But as the leaves began to fall from the trees along the Cumbrian coast that autumn, Macmillan's high diplomacy and Windscale's nuclear science were coming into dangerous conflict. The Site Technical Committee in early September extended the gaps between Wigner releases to 40,000 megawatt days. So it was only on Monday, October 7th, just two weeks before an Eisenhower summit, that a long delayed Wigner release from pile number one began. In the first hours of heating the pile, the release seemed to stall. So on the morning of the 8th, the physicist in charge decided to try to kickstart the release by adding more heat. He appears to have overdone it. Over the following 24 hours, Temperatures inside the reactor began to soar. Nobody seems to have noticed. At some point, a can containing uranium fuel burst, but an alarm that should have warned of a burst never sounded. More cans burst. Only after lunch on October 10th did anyone get wise. Air samplers on the roof of a neighbouring building recorded radioactivity pouring out of the chimney pile. Soon there was smoke. The filters on top of the chimney had been overwhelmed. Now, that's just the briefest um, summary of what happened at Windscale. If you want to know more, as I say, I recommend Fallout by Fred Pierce or a book called Sellafield Stories, which is an oral history of the plant and it's Windscale and, of course, it's Sellafield days. Um, and it doesn't just look at the disaster. It looks at the whole culture of the plant, the working practices, which were quite terrifying, especially in the early days, and how it affected the local community. I do recommend that book. So, after Windscale, there was a ban on milk from local farms. The Guardian reported that police went around uh, warning local farmers not to distribute any of their milk the next morning. And eventually there was a ban on all milk in the area, and so supplies had to be brought in from outside the forbidden area. Now, they were bringing in fresh milk for, of course, the community to drink, but what about all the milk which was already inside the forbidden area? Well, they tested it, they found it contaminated, and they simply poured it into the Irish Sea. Thousands of gallons of the stuff, and this practice continued every day until the Atomic Energy Authority finally said it was safe. And of course this happened every day because cows have to be milked regularly. You don't just milk them after the disaster and that gets rid of all the bad stuff. They had to keep being milked of course. And so the local area kept on producing milk which was deemed unsafe. And so it kept on being poured into the Irish Sea. I'm surprised the sea didn't turn white and sour and lumpy. Now the Guardian spoke to locals about this and one of them said, you never know what's going to happen next, do you? You have to be so careful with these radio activities. And the paper also tells us of a local farmer, dairy farmer, called Mr Mutton. And he said that he was known for his excellent milk. Everyone in the vicinity knew Mr. Mutton's milk, and he had an excellent record of producing great milk, or his cows did rather, and it was only, that the paper says, in the hottest days of summer, 
when it was possible for perhaps one customer to detect a tiny hint of sourness in Mr. Mutton's excellent milk. And that certainly never happened in the cool days of autumn or the cold days of winter. But in October 57, after the Windscale fire, Mr. Mutton was baffled and perplexed to find that customers were calling him to complain that his milk tasted a bit sour. He said that there was one October day when every second customer was complaining. He, he thought that was unthinkable. Never happened before, never. And certainly not in the cool days of October. These complaints went on for three days in succession and Mr Mutton was baffled. The first complaints were on Saturday about milk which had been yielded the day before on the Friday. And of course, the Friday was the day after the fire at Windscale. The paper says that Mr Mutton is prepared to accept this could simply be a coincidence. Now, on an even more humorous note, I found a poem about this massive disposal of Windscale milk in The Guardian, and I'll read it to you. But before I do, let me just explain the context, because the poem mentions Devon. And Devon, of course, is at the other end of the country from Windscale. So what does Devon have to do with it? Well, I did some research in the local newspapers, and I think the Devon thing refers to a news story from October 57, where a Devon farmer bought five cows from Ulverston, which is near Windscale. He bought them after the accident, which shouldn't have been allowed, but the cows were sold. He took them to a cattle market in Exeter and sold them on. It was then realised that these poor cows might be contaminated. So the police went to the doors of all the farmers in Exeter who'd bought those cows and told them these cows might be affected by the nuclear accident. You cannot sell any of their milk. One farmer who had bought one of the suspect cows was a Mrs Toms of a farm called Black Dog. She said to the paper, They told me the cow I had bought might be affected by atomic radiation and that I must pour the milk down a drain. We have 24 cows and the milk from this particular animal has been going in the churn with the rest and sent to the factory. It's dreadful to think the authorities have allowed these animals to leave the affected area. So the mild panic in Devon was gently mocked in The Guardian by the printing of this poem. Oh Mary, do not call the windscale kine, once radioactive kine, surcharged with iodine, from the atom factory. There is no need to send them up the line to Lakeland's Windy Lee. No, Mary, you need not the cattle call in view of the outfall that leaked from Calder Hall, for now the Ministry announces that there is no risk at all to the Devon Creamery. So, Mary, make Devonians understand that though all milk was banned, produced in Cumberland by herds of pedigree, and rushed in sealed containers to the strand and dumped into the sea. Go, Mary, say the Ministry explains, no isotope remains. The colloids it contains with none will disagree. There is no need to pour it down the drains. This milk they will guarantee. Oh, Mary, do not call the dairy cows. For milking Lakeland cows the Ministry allows, since it is atom-free. Do not call home the cows that used to browse on Windscale's Windy Lee.